Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alive in the Word as we look at the blessed, brief little book, the shortest book in the Bible, 3rd John. And this is my teacher and friend, Michael Harner. I'm glad you're helping us today. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here wrapping this series up. Uh, it, you know, this has been quite a series as verse by verse we've yeah. gone through the books of 1st John, 2nd John, and now we're going through the book of 3rd John. And if this is your first time to join us, uh, we encourage you to go back and look at the other studies. Uh, it will be a blessing and encouragement to you and help to you in, as you grow in your faith. But today we're going to be looking at the shortest book in the Bible, 3rd yeah. John. And uh, the main idea uh, for this study that we're going to go into today is uh, as followers of Jesus, our lives and reputations ought to reflect His love, ought to re re reflect the affection and hospitality that Christ mm -hmm. shows us by grace so we reflect and show that by grace to others as well. Yeah. And what uh, this letter does is uh, it really gets practical because it's, just, it's uh, character studies. He's got four men here that we want to look at and look at their character, their reputation, how they live the life, and things we can emulate and things we could avoid. And so it's really where the rubber meets the road. It's a good way to wrap up all of this because he's given us some examples here to actually look at and, and talk about you know, as, as far as uh, how to live the Christian life and, and how to avoid the problems of uh, this one guy named Diotrephes. Yeah, <laughs> boy, that's the truth. Uh, I, I'm just glad that you could pronounce his name right. Uh, it, it's a great way for us to wind up this, uh, this study. We've been using, by the way, uh, the Christ-Centered Exposition Series by Dr. Daniel Aiken on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If you'd like to get a copy of your own, uh, then simply go on Lifeway, on um, their website, and you can order it from uh, Holman Publishing Company. And uh, it's a great addition to your own Christian library of books in helping you understand and study uh, God's Word. This will be our, our guide today as we look at what God has said to us in the book of 3rd John. So our teaching guide is coming uh, from this book by commentary by Dr. Aiken. Uh, now here's the, here's the question that as he wraps up this commentary from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we come to the last chapter and Dr. Aiken in this last study asks this question. Does your life bring praise to the name of Jesus? Yeah. What a great way to summarize everything that we've been going through in, in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's right. I mean, because, you know, ultimately we're here for the glory of God, to bring Him glory and to give glory to Him, and it's not for ourselves. And so that's the central question. Does our life bring praise to the name of Jesus? You know, one of the things, Michael, that as Christians, uh, especially here in America, we need to remember that uh, more so maybe than ever before in the history of this country, uh, are people watching Christians yeah. Uh, with skepticism, mm -hmm. cynicism, uh, criticism, yeah. uh, looking for a Christian to stumble, to make a mistake, um, to act in a way that the world would say is unbecoming and perhaps God would say right. unbecoming of our faith because they're looking for ways to criticize the church and, and really pull people away from the church. I think it's important for us to realize that once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, especially in the world and culture in which yeah. we live, that people are going to uh, watch you and people are going to talk about you. Mm -hmm. So the question is not will people see you and will people say something about you. The question is what will they see when they look at you or what will they say when they look at you. Yeah. And, and 3rd John is a wonderful reminder and, and in ways a warning yeah. for us to guard our reputations yeah and guard our testimonies before a watching world, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, Danny Aiken says, all of us share an invaluable possession, and that's our reputation. That's right. And so once you lose it, you can't regain it. It's very difficult to regain it. And we've seen people, you know, fall over the, you know, last few decades over and over again. Yes. And it's very rare when they can uh, get back to where they were where they, before they fell. Yes, and, and the harm that happens when you have a notable Christian leader, and there are several mm -hmm. that are being written about these days and have been for some time in, so, in the social media world and, and on blogs and websites, uh, and, and many of the criticisms are deserved. Sure. Um, the yeah. failures, the sins, the duplicity, um, the hypocrisy, yep. it is mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Right. But as a Christian, and as a church, we must remember 
God never calls us to give the world each other and that's how people are saved. God calls us to give the world the only one by which anyone can be saved and that is to give the world Jesus Christ. When we fall into the trap of giving the world our favorite preacher, our favorite Christian singer, or our favorite Christian uh, sports star, our favorite Christian author, we are setting them and ourselves up for disappointment. Even Dr. Billy Graham said, if you knew me and watched me and saw me 24-7, yeah. as God knows me and sees me, um, you would be disappointed and you would see things right. that um, you... Uh, that were weaknesses in my own life. And, and that was Billy Graham. Yeah, Bib yeah. Uh, The truth is there's only one perfect person in the world and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But that is not to be an excuse, is it, for no. us being lazy when it comes to our guarding our character, uh, guarding our conduct, or living out our faith. Right, it's not an excuse. I mean, we're called to be followers of Jesus Christ and to walk like Him. And so that does require certain disciplines in our lives, you know, to set aside our own desires, our own passions, our own uh, plans in order to follow His desires and plans and purposes for our lives. And so when we do that, then all of a sudden we put Him first instead of ourselves. And so, yes. uh, and, and so that's, uh, you know, Billy Graham is, is absolutely correct. I mean, many times you see that people, the, the, uh, the closer they get to God, the, the, the more sinful they realize they are. Yes. And so as you discover who <laughs> Jesus Christ and who God the Father is and their holiness, uh, it, it really just shakes you sometimes. And you say, uh, that's why I, I love the verse, uh, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were mm. yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's like, wow. I mean, he, he, he demonstrated his love that way. You know, we were against him. We were yes. sinners. We were enemies of God. And yet he still loves us. So how can we... Uh, uh, think highly of ourselves uh, because of uh, that we're good or great or anything else. Uh, he actually shows us what true uh, grace and mercy and love is. Now, Michael, you're a father and now a grandfather. Yes. Uh, speak to us for just a moment as we begin our study. How important is it for you, for the sake of your children, um, for the sake of your grandchildren, to protect your own reputation and live out that reputation of your faith as a Christian man? Yeah, um, I mean, that's something you have to guard your whole life. I mean, and it starts when they're young. You know, obviously you can't lose or escape your reputation. And uh, I remember um, <clears throat> we had a, uh, Charles Fuller here when he used to baptize people in the pulpit, I mean, in, up in the baptistry. He would say uh, to little boys, he would say, you're never more a man than when you tell someone about Jesus. Mm, and so, you know, a lot of times, People think they can pursue other things to show their manliness. Yeah. And, but he was saying, you know, the, the most primary thing is talk about your relationship with Jesus Christ and don't be embarrassed or ashamed of that. And then all the other things typically will take care of themselves. Boy, that is a great word and a great reminder. Now, yeah. now John begins um, his, his third letter by talking about a man who did have a good reputation, yes. a godly man, and his name was Gaius. Mm -hmm. He was a man that had the right spiritual and the right moral uh, fiber uh, and character uh, in his life. Uh, Michael, would you uh, read the first two verses sure. of, of this uh, uh, wonderful little book yeah. as we get started? The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So here he's talking about living spiritually, yeah. isn't he? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is that, uh, why is that important that, that as physical beings that we live spiritual lives of integrity and honesty? Well, I mean, part of it is that uh, we want to be spiritually fit and healthy. Um, he's saying, I, I pray that you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So it's uh, so important for us to uh, be spiritually fit and healthy, mm -hmm. to live that way, not to uh, chase other things. And so many times people put so much emphasis on their, uh, their physical body yes. and ignore the spiritual. And so I think uh, John is praising Gaius for having the right approach. And, uh, and he's, he's, he's balanced in his uh, life and he leads it off by saying, first of all, you're living spiritually. You know, there's a real danger that when we spend too much time 
um, uh, working on the outside of ourselves, that we can sometimes even fall in love with the outside right. of ourselves yeah. and forget that no matter how attractive or handsome the outside might appear to be, God sees the inside. And it's what's on the inside that counts. And, and one of the things that I've seen that is true with people as we age, oftentimes what's on the inside works its way yeah. on the outside. That's right. Yeah. And you see some people uh, really getting um, um, uh, more attractive in their outlook and their personality and their smile and the brightness of their eyes. At the same time, you see some people becoming less attractive and mm -hmm. uh, really a dimness right. seems to characterize uh, the look in their eyes and, and a dullness when it comes to uh, any comments or attitudes they express about their faith in Christ. Yeah. And, and that's so sad. As oh, yeah. Christians, we should be striving, as Paul said, to finish well mm -hmm. and, and looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, he uses the word prosper, mm -hmm. which conveys the idea of having a good journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and then his prayer for health would be similar to, to our idea of, of wanting someone to have a clean bill of health right. uh, personally. So it's just a personal yeah. uh, um, um, desire or blessing, isn't it, that John's Absolutely. giving Absolutely, and he's saying beloved. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's got his uh, affinity, this affection for Gaius, and he, he, he genuinely wants the best for Gaius, that him to succeed and be healthy physically as well as uh, just as your soul's prosper prosperous as he is spiritually. But John also commends Gaius for walking truthfully in yeah. verses 3 and 4. Michael, would yeah. you read those verses for us, please? For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in truth. And I love that verse for children and grandchildren. <laughs> it's a great verse to pray over, you isn't it? You have no greater joy than to That's right. hear of your children walking in truth. Yep. How do you think that applies to Gaius in, in the context of, of John, an, an elderly uh, follower of Christ, an apostle of the church? Uh, what do you think he meant when he said the word children? Well, he's t he has this uh, relationship to them where he's concerned for them as a father would be. Uh, and so he, he really he uses the term little children in the book of 1 John, the letter that he wrote. First John, little children. So he's, it's an affectionate term, and he wants them to succeed. And uh, as if he, uh, as their spiritual father, the one who mentored them and came along and supported them and helped them and prayed for them. And so I think it's a term of endearment, as uh, you know, especially that he uses uniquely for him. Um, but he loves it, the fact that uh, he's he's walking in the truth. He's obeying the truth. Um, you know, in First John, John says that uh, I saw Jesus, I handled Jesus, I touched him, I heard him, and he's just all excited about it. And now he's seeing people who have come along behind him, you know, in 80, 85 or 90. Mm. Have, he wants them to have that same sense of joy and obedience and love for Jesus Christ that, that he had as he experienced him firsthand. How do you think, Michael, a, a mature Christian, someone who's walked with the Lord for many, many years, um, um, how is that? healthy and helpful in a local church community when that older brother or sister in Christ looks at younger believers as as children. Mm -hmm. Not in a demeaning way, no, no. not in a patronizing yeah. way, because that's not what John means. But why is that healthy and helpful to a multi-generational church community? Well, I think that uh, it, one, it encourages a person to step up and take uh, responsibility and to serve. Um, I had a that personal experience here at our church and John Sims uh, who's gone on to yes. be with the Lord and uh, I can't tell you the number of times that he came up to me and he'd say you know I think you ought to be serving or doing this or that and he was just you know uh, it was encouraging in the Lord just to have him uh, this esteemed respected man of God that would come up and uh, take time to just speak to I me. I remember and, and John person. yes yeah. and had that deep wonderful <laughs> deep, that's voice right, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know Michael I, I think when an adult really has a tender, respectful attitude yeah. towards a child, they are not more focused on themselves, they are more focused on that child. Yeah. And, and for me, one of the things that's, that's beautiful in the life of a church when you have mature, godly men and women walking in their faith, 
uh, and have been done so for a long time, and they see others around them in the body of Christ that are doing some crazy things or inconsistent or are struggling or have a ways to go, instead of letting what's happening really bother them and aggravate them, uh, they're more patient. Yeah, absolutely. and and they like a adult would be with a child in their Sunday school class, or a parent would be with their their son or daughter. And so that's a good reminder for us, isn't it, to be patient with each other? Absolutely. And and we have to understand that uh, life goes on after we're gone. And so we have to look to the future. And just as John, I mean, he could have embraced traditions and everything else that he had done in the past, but he, he recognized that uh, the, the kingdom work needed to move on after he was long gone. Well, we certainly don't want the church to die with us. Absolutely we want it not. to go on with those who will come after us, Absolutely. come behind us. Absolutely. Well, then in verses uh, 5 and 6, he talks about serving. Uh, would you read those verses yeah. for us, please, Mike? Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Here John is basically saying, um, just keep doing what you're doing. You're yeah. doing the right things. Don't let them get away from you. Don't become uh, bored with them. But please keep up the good work. That's, that's the idea yeah. that he's talking about Gaius. That Gaius is doing the right work, but he says don't stop doing the right work. Hang in there. And sometimes that's hard to do, isn't yeah, it? it is. And I imagine it was for Gaius. And yet maybe John could, knew something. He knew there was battles or challenges, mm -hmm. uh, changes that Gael, Gaius was struggling with. And so he wanted to affirm him and encourage him Absolutely. to hang in there and yeah. keep doing what is right. Yeah, he was showing hospitality to probably traveling evangelists. And he was providing lodging and food and just support. And uh, <clears throat> he wasn't just... Uh, vocalizing it, but he was actually doing things to actually help the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I had a longtime friend back in Arkansas and, and he would refer to the do right rule. And, and the question would be, well, when is it right to do the do right rule? And he would say, it's always right to do the do right rule. Yeah. It's always right to do the right thing. Don't stop. And one of the problems that happens in a lot of churches and a lot of families, I think it's happening in our nation as well today, is we have a lot of Christians that are um, getting tired of doing the right thing or they're losing uh, hope yeah. or confidence in doing the right thing. Don't stop. Faithfulness means never quitting. Yeah. Never quitting. And then in verses 7 and 8, he talks about Gaius ministering generously, doesn't he, Yes, Michael? he does. Uh, he says, For they went out from, for the sake of the name, and the name is capitalized there, mm -hmm. name of Jesus Christ, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. And so uh, Gaius was very generous. He was ministering gener generously to those for the sake of the name. That is the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He wasn't doing it for his own reputation, for his own, That's so the right. people pat him on the back, all oh, this guy's uh, taking care of these people that are coming around. No, he's doing it because he loved Jesus and he wants to show Jesus. To those, uh, you know, it's been said many times that, that you'll be surprised how much good God will use you to do and help you to do and lead you to do if you don't care who gets the credit. Right. And, and I think that's, that's so true mm -hmm. that sometimes we can let jealousies and pride and ego creep in and wonderful ministries that, that God had started and God had blessed can then begin to falter and stumble and yeah. sometimes even crumble because people become more concerned about who's getting the credit rather than God getting the glory. Right. And then he says that we ought to support such men so they can, we can be co-workers or fellow workers with the truth. And so as we do that, as we set aside our uh, own uh, desires and wants and, and begin to serve mm -hmm. those who... Uh, or serving Jesus Christ, or preaching, and or the traveling evangelist, then we're co-workers with the truth. Yes, and it, and if you're a Christian, and you're a part of a local church family, then remember that you are you are a part of that pastor's ministry, that youth minister's ministry, that minister of worship and music's ministry, that children's minister's ministry. Uh, in that local church family, 
We should be supporting that which God has entrusted to us and enabled us and blessed us to do and be that co-laborer yeah. that Gaius was yes. with those that he was serving with. Right. But unfortunately, there was someone else yeah. that <laughs> was really the polar opposite, wasn't yeah. he, of, of Gaius. Yeah. Who is this He's person? Diotrephes. And uh, he's the man with the harmful agenda. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. Uh, uh, and, and he talks about him in verses 9 and 10. Would you yeah, read those verses sure. for us, please? I wrote something to the church by Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Wow. Michael, it sounds like the bottom line is he wanted to be the boss all the time, my Absolutely. way or highway. Yeah, he loved himself and not others. Even to the extent that if someone confronted him or wouldn't do as he said or he was bothered by them, he just put them out of the church. Oh, yeah. Him. Yeah, he had personal pride. He wanted to be the CEO, the captain of the ship. And if anyone disagreed with him, um, he put them out. You know, um, John commended Gaius in four areas, and he uh, condemns atrophies in four areas, doesn't right. he? Yeah. One of those is he's, he, he was driven by prideful ambition. Yeah, he wanted praise and honor for himself. You know, Colossians 1.18 says, Only Jesus is to have first place in everything. You know, doctrine... He's, his problem wasn't doctrinal, uh, it, it, it was personal, wasn't right. it? Mm -hmm. And that happens when we come to a place where we stop wanting to uh, point others to Christ so that Christ has first place in everything that we do and say. Right. Uh, but also he talks about in verse 9, uh, do not display a pompous arrogance uh, because that's also what he was guilty of doing. Yeah, and it's amazing because he says that he wouldn't even receive John. You know, um, he doesn't, um, he, he wouldn't receive John and the missionaries that came around. So, I mean, and that's incredible that he wouldn't receive the Apostle John. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. The beloved disciple, the one who was one of Jesus' closest friends on right. earth. I guess John was old news and he thought uh, he's a has-been, he's, he, he's, his time has passed. You know, and, and that's a warning for the church today. Simply because it's been done for a while doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do for today. Right. And uh, there are a lot of wonderful uh, truths wrapped up in, in blessed hymns, yep. uh, anthems, gospel songs. And I'm so glad that, that we work to include yeah. uh, a little bit of everything, Absolutely. maybe new arrangements, but the words of songs that were based on Scripture that we have sung for years are so important, and we shouldn't let them go, should we? No, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. And, and simply because it's something that has been there for a while doesn't necessarily mean it's something that should go away. Right, that's right. Uh, and, and I think that was really uh, as much an indication of uh, Dottrasny's um, his own arrogance and pride yes. as it was anything else. In, in verse 10, uh, he says two things. Uh, he says, don't deliver perverse accusations. Yep. Evidently, he was gossiping in a malicious fashion mm -hmm. uh, with the intention of tearing others down. Yep. He was talking trash about brothers and sisters in Christ. Yep. And then he also talks about in verse 10, don't dominate with profane activity. Yes. Uh, and Dr. Aiken writes uh, that his ambition led to arrogance. Yep which led to accusation and culminating in profane actions or activities. Right. And like you said, he not only resisted and rejected John, but it looks like he slandered him as well as giving him a cold yeah. shoulder. Yeah. One thing we need to do is use this story as a mirror to, to examine ourselves and not as a binocular to check out everybody else. I mean, you know, it's easy for us to talk about the diatrophies, you know, in this way, but we need to check it out ourselves. Are, Boy, we, that's exactly are we allowing right. our ambition, our arrogance, uh, is it leading to, you know, profane activity or actions within our lives? And, and if you're watching the study, just as we have said from the beginning, uh, as we go through uh, this book or any book of the Bible uh, here at Alive in the Word, it's not just a matter of learning things you didn't know or gaining knowledge you didn't have, but allowing the Holy yeah. Spirit to help you to see uh, the truth of God's Word as it relates and needs to be applied to your life. Uh, and that's where the real benefit of personal Bible study Absolutely. comes, Michael. Uh, in verses 11 and 12, we have a third person that John introduces to yep. us. And uh, it's a man by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius, yeah. So they, 
he contrasts Diotrephes with Demetrius. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. You know, uh, the word imitate that, that John is using there is related to our word for mimic. Mm -hmm. and, and why imitate or mimic one uh, over the other? Because uh, one was not good right. and one was good. And yep. I think John is drawing that comparison. And that's so important for us as Christians to have those more mature, godly men and women that we know and we've built relationships with at church that we can imitate, yes. follow their example, as Paul said to Timothy, is mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, um, Danny Aiken says he gives tangible evidence that he belongs to God. And so you're, you can actually see his life, and then you know that he belongs to God. Mm -hmm. um, and so ultimately, we should imitate Jesus Christ, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He's our supreme example who never fails us. And, uh, but we do have earthly examples. We need earthly examples to yes. help us in our lives. And, and it should be that what motivates you to want to follow the example of another Christian is that Christian is living out and showing you yes, Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then he talks about in verse 12, uh, maintain or possess that good testimony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is the gospel in in real life, in our yeah. actions yeah. and in our deeds and oh, our yeah. attitudes, uh, to seek to be men and women of, of character, of Christian integrity. Yep. Uh, and then he comes to verses 13 and 14 as we wrap up our study today, uh, talking about the fourth person. Yeah. And this is John himself, isn't it? That's right. And he closes uh, this letter just similar to Second John. He says, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Peace be with you or be to you. The uh, friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And you know, so, what are the two things that he's pointing out for us here as he wraps up uh, Third John? He really desires to be in the presence of his fellow believers. I mean, he's got a pastor's heart. Uh, we see that in this uh, picture of John here. I mean, he's not just saying, I want to throw some stuff out and give you a letter and, and don't care. I want to be with you. I want to communicate with you. There's nothing, su no substitute for a personal touch. And then the second thing is the desire for peace for fellow believers. He doesn't want them to be torn apart by diatrophies or mm -hmm. these false teachers that are leading them astray. He wants peace in their life. And that peace comes from uh, Jesus Christ. Yes, he says, peace to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. Yep. What a wonderful and warm conclusion yep. uh, John gives us as he closes out Third yes. John. Yes. Uh, Michael, this has been a great yeah, study. Excellent. And uh, we hope you have enjoyed it as well. And uh, if you have, uh, share with your friends and other family members how they can go online and and watch and be a part of this Bible study right here, Alive in the Word. Uh, Michael, as we wrap up our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John yeah. today, uh, would you please lead us in prayer sure. as we close? Absolutely. Father, we thank you today for this time the, as we're concluding our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Lord, we've learned so much. And Lord, it's so deep and so powerful. We, Lord, we pray that you'll just help us to, um, to uh, take it in. Lord, that we might not... Uh, uh, pass it by, but Lord, allow it to penetrate our hearts that we might be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that we might become more like Him every day, mm, yes. that we might walk with Him. And so Lord, I pray for peace for our friends who are watching. Lord, I pray for our peace for our family, a church family, and those around us, Lord, that we might um, uh, ultimately display the hope of this within us, that we might bear witness to Jesus Christ who makes all the difference in our world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friend, for watching Alive in the Word. And if you can, be sure to be in church somewhere this Sunday.